the session on um, what they don't teach in business school about entrepreneurship, uh, having taught entrepreneurship at the Stanford Business School for something like 13 years. I can tell you there's a lot. Some of it we know we don't teach, and some of it we probably should teach if we knew a little more about the subject. So I think it's a very pertinent um, subject today. So Mike, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you did. Now, just remember, I've got a little bio here. Okay. So if you don't include things, I can include it. And if you, if you do include things that, that aren't in here, I may question you. On. Okay. It's, a, it's like the Senate uh, Investigation Committee. Exactly. Um, Except you're not sitting out there. But I do get lights flashing at me. Oh, that's true. Um, so I've been the CEO and co-founder of four startups. Um, I was very lucky with the first three. Um, one was, uh, the first one was, I started with $500 of myself and each of my two partners put in $500. So we had $1,500. We started it in my second year of business school at the, um, the business, the Stanford of the East Coast uh, in Boston. Um, You're very kind. <laughs> we, uh, we never raised venture capital. Uh, this, it started as a company called Dyla Fish. It was where you could order groceries from home. Um, it was insane. Uh, it was before the internet and everything. Um, we eventually sold it for, thir we had to change direction because that was not going to work, uh, into a computer telephony tool. Uh, we sold it for $13 million um, a few years later, which was tiny for Silicon Valley standards, but you know, a, a fair New England return on the $1,500 investment. Uh, the second company was Direct Hit, which was an internet um, search engine. Nobody ever heard of internet, uh, Direct Hit, but we were providing search results to Microsoft, AOL, Lycos, um, we're kind of a behind the scenes provider. And it was the right time. Uh, we grew to a market value of $500 million, 500 days after we launched it, and we sold it uh, in January of 2000. And then the third company was uh, Xfire, which is an instant messenger for uh, PC video gamers. It spread virally. Um, we s got to about 3 million users uh, two years after launching, we sold it for $100 million to MTV, and now there's 15 million users uh, using it. And um, I'm now working on my fourth one, which uh, I could end up being, I want to be 4 and 0, but I could be 3 and 1, because we haven't sort of found the formula for success on Ruba. Ruba is a travel site. Um, so that's sort of my background. And when did you graduate from um, Harvard? Oh, a long, long time ago. We well, have to get into numbers. You know, yeah, the, yeah. Well, the reason why is it's sort of interesting to know the timing of your first venture, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was, you said, prior to the Internet. Yes. But uh, so you were, you were actually a leader in that. Others came after you, also didn't do very well, right? Uh, so I would You may have been the, the, the biggest winner in that whole space of ordering food from home. Uh, if we had started a different time. Well, um, you you sold it for thirteen million dollars. Yeah. Um, most of the other companies I know lost money, <laughs> right? So it win by default. Yeah. Um, sure. So um, I decided I was going to stop uh, aging at, at age thirty-one. So I graduated Harvard from nineteen ninety-one. So I must have graduated around age eleven. So we can just, you can figure out. From Good. All right. Thank you, Zilla. So um, I'm Nazila Alasti and. Um, I started life as an engineer. I'm Iranian originally, and in my country, if you're a good student, you either become a doctor or an engineer. So there was, that was the choice, and I was scared of blood, so <laughs> off I went into engineering school. But it was actually um, a really great uh, background, I thought, for um, Silicon Valley. I didn't know I would end up here, but I did. And I was thankful for my parents for having pushed me into engineering. Um, fast forward five years of working um, at a technology company, Advanced Micro Devices. Um, I became a project designer, project lead, um, went to a business school, and learned that people can actually uh, make money selling pencils and that it doesn't have to be semiconductors. That was my big uh, learning from, from business school. Um, Entrepreneurial activities at the time were not as hot as they are now. What was it? When did you graduate? Uh, I graduated in 88. 88? So I also stopped aging at 30. Um, a few years <laughs> earlier than you. Yeah. Um, and, and I have to say that my experience at business school um, 
uh, was really eye-opening, broadening, uh, but I wouldn't say that I was focused on necessarily becoming an entrepreneur. It seemed very risky at the time. Um, however, after I got out and um, experienced the venture capital world for a couple of years and then went on to work at Apple, uh, which I consider really uh, my formative years at Apple, and worked on a big failure of a project called Newton, which was the original handheld device, um, I came to understand that I really needed more freedom in my life and that the corporate structure wasn't providing that and I was stupid enough or naive enough uh, to say that I could do things on my own. So I started a long line of all sorts of startups, <laughs> failures as well as success, at, um, and ended up now running Juniors, which is my first uh, from PowerPoint to funding to product startup, uh, where I am CEO, founder, and I'm um, growing that business. So that's a little bit about me. Zilla is also the mother of two daughters. Yes, I am. And. Um, someone who is uh, passionate about trying to help those of you who um, uh, are thinking about entrepreneurship learn more about it. So that's why she's here today. Yeah, uh, let me add to that, Chuck. Sure. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, uh, I also want to talk to the women in, in the group, if you're interested afterwards, about why I believe entrepreneurship is actually a very valid choice and, and, and compatible with being a mother. So anyone who's interested in discussing that, I'm open to doing that. Um, the world will tell you, no, it's 24-7, etc. Unless you burn the midnight oil, you won't be successful. I happen to have a different story. So if anyone is interested, I'm happy to share that. Great, thank you. So we, we talked to, we've heard from two people who actually had technical backgrounds. Uh, will, um, give us your background and, and uh, what you're doing now. Thanks, Chuck. So I graduated in 1999 from Kellogg and I've been in the Valley since then. I've done a combination of both startups and venture capital activity. So currently I'm the CEO of a Sequoia and Hummer Winblad funded company uh, called Widget Box. And um, I joined Widget Box two years ago and before that I was the managing director at Hummer Winblad and spent six years in the venture capital business. So since I got out of business school, I've had uh, kind of the opportunity to see both uh, entrepreneurs in action as a venture backer and thinking through business models and deciding who to finance and who not to finance. And then um, also d having decided that uh, to become an entrepreneur myself, and uh, it's only recently I even consider myself one, quite honestly. But the last couple of years of running a small startup that's not profitable makes you one, I think. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a very interesting yeah. time to run a, run a company. So uh, no, I'm definitely excited to be here today and kind of share my thoughts um, about what business school taught me, what it didn't taught me, to teach me about um, you know, how to, to, to lead a company, bring products to market, sell, et cetera. And uh, Chuck's right, like in terms of backgrounds, I went to Harvard, studied East Asian studies and finance and started my career actually in, in Asia. So I worked in Hong Kong and Singapore, spoke Mandarin Chinese and thought I was going to be part of the Asian miracle. And, um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so, that, so I've done, uh, I'm not coming from an engineering background in other words and so part of you know, one of the questions today I think is how do MBAs and finance people fit into a culture that's really driven by, by uh, engineers as opposed to business types and kind of the MBA being a joke as opposed to something good. Um, so uh, I, you know, I'm happy to be here and, and look forward to a good discussion. Now one of the things, uh, Will, if I'm, if I'm correct in reading this and listening to you, you you formed uh, you uh, you joined Widget Box after it had actually been founded. That's correct. So there were three technical founders. Uh, they'd actually raised ten million dollars before I got Some there. Some from you. Some from me. I was the seed financer, and then Sequoia did the A round, and then um, Brent Jones and Tommy Bardell at Northgate did the B round. And uh, at that point, they were looking for a CEO, and uh, they they did a nine month search. And the last guy that we made the offer to, I tell, told myself at the dinner, if this guy doesn't take the job, I'm doing it. He didn't take the job. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, so some different paths here. I mean, starting their own company, going out and trying to, to find uh, the idea, put the team together, uh, versus joining a startup after it's had the, the initial founders. The, the way we want to start this is to, is to ask them a little bit about what led them to decide to follow an entrepreneurial path um, because many of you are in business school or not in business school, you're thinking about this and you've got a set of ideas in your head as to what it's going to be
be like to be an entrepreneur. Um, and then what has been the biggest surprise for them as they joined the entrepreneurial world? So you've got a vision, what led you to, 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 to do this, and then what's been the biggest surprise once you, once you jumped in? Let's start with Nazila. Um, so I, I think I touched on that. Uh, for me, the, my job was such a big part of my life that unless I was very creative and had the freedom to do what I wanted to do, and didn't have to explain myself too much, um, I wasn't happy. Uh, so I thought that a smaller environment, less bureaucratic environment would, would afford that. I wanted to be my own boss um, uh, and um, kind of live and die by the decisions that uh, I made. I also like adrenaline. I like living on the edge. Um, I like being pushed to make decisions. I um, felt that I had too much cushion at Apple, frankly. Um, my decisions really didn't make a difference. The juggernaut was going on, and I was doing my best, but you know, um, w where was my contribution, really? So those were some of the reasons um, that I decided to jump into the entrepreneurial pool. Um, the biggest surprise, though, and this probably you all are smarter than I was. I, I'm an immigrant, so I always thought of myself as someone who can do anything. Just, just give the problem to me. I'll do it. I'll take care of it. I really never put too much um, emphasis or attention on partners. And I learned the lesson the hard way that um, in a startup environment, the biggest surprise for me was how much you needed partners. Just like you can't have a, well, you can't have a baby on your own, I suppose. You could go <laughs> adopt one, and maybe that's what you did um, coming in late as a CEO. I, I don't know, you know, the analogy stops there. Um, but, but, but I, you know, I cannot emphasize the importance of partners, and I cannot emphasize how much I was lacking in that dimension, um, and how much I wish, had I done things a uh, different way, to go back and make ideas, joint ideas, as opposed to my idea. So that was the biggest surprise for are you me. thinking about a, a partner in the sense of a founding partner, or are you thinking about a partner in terms of somebody in the supply ch chain or the, the, the oh, distribution a, a, a channel? Oh, a founding or partner more. Founding partner. Yeah, and, and um, I also, just let me briefly say that I, I think um, my experience in business school told me what I was good at not what I was lacking. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, if I were to do it again, I would emphasize a lot what I'm lacking so that that defines the type of partner you'll be looking for. Um, so more on that if, okay. if the discussion goes that way. Okay, Will? Yeah, for me, I think it was just a combination of a lot of different variables. But if you, if you think about where we live today, right now in this valley, it's almost like how could you not do it? Uh, you know, if not now, when? You know, and this is a, the whole ecosystem here is geared towards risk taking, testing yourself. There's a whole, you know, obviously a huge base of institutional venture capital support. Legal systems are here. And it, it really it came down to, I remember doing an investment when I was in, uh, in the investment side about how to test semiconductors. And at the time, there was the state of the art was testing a quarter of the wafer. And then it was half the wafer. And then finally this breakthrough to test the full wafer. And I feel like entrepreneurship is a full wafer test. It's, ev it's testing every part of who you are. It's testing your passion, your endurance, your perseverance, your leadership skills, your sales ability. Uh, you know, it, 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 and uh, I just felt that if I was 65 looking back on my career, I would never forgive myself for living in this environment at this time and not testing the whole wafer. You know, and so venture capital is a great job, but it's it's literally uh, it's a it's a research job, you know, where and it, it's a job where you make uh, investment decisions. And I always felt when I met with the entrepreneurs, I'm like, God, these guys, you know, I admire them so much, and uh, they just got to the point where I I couldn't imagine not doing it. And hey, once you jumped in, what was the biggest surprise? The biggest surprise was um, it being okay that you don't have all the answers and trusting in process to help you get to an answer. Like I really thought, because as an investor, you're hypothesis driven. You believe that you're making an investment based on the following characterization, A, B, and C, therefore D. And as soon as you start running a company, you realize none of those hypotheses <laughs> work. And and you're, because the venture guy, you're paid to have an opinion when they say, Will, what's your opinion on this deal? 
you have an opinion. And all of a sudden I realized, like, shit, I don't even, have, I don't even know what to do now. Like, and, and realizing that mm -hmm. that was a very unnatural feeling because I, I prided myself on always knowing of you and realizing now I don't know. I don't, I, and we, we basically, the, in the context of this is we had no idea how to make money, none. And like dealing with that and accepting that and then realizing like, well, how are we gonna get out of this problem? And just deciding that, okay, it's a, I'm reminded when Nick Saban won the national championship, he said that, hey, we believe in process, not results at Alabama. And what did that mean? What he meant was that if you know how to block, you know how to play defense, you know how to do these things, you just play the game and then you trust the process to help you get to the result that you want. But so rather than a random act of heroism where you're gonna have this flash of genius that's gonna make you rich, just deciding to slowly, steadily plod your way in a predictable way where you're going and then trusting that that's gonna help you arrive at the right answer as opposed to a priori saying, I have the answer, now we'll just make that happen. That was a really hard transition uh, from you know, being an investment hypothesis driven thinker to a process driven thinker. Mike. Um, <clears throat> I, out of engineering school, I went worked at a place called Hughes, Air, Hughes Aircraft Company, and one of the projects I got to work on was a solar powered race car, and it was a totally cool job. Uh, we raced across Australia from Darwin to Adelaide, wow. and um, this car. Before we built this car, the fastest again this was a long time ago. The fastest solar powered cars were going maybe 20 miles an hour, maybe 22 miles an hour, um, and um, we built a car that could go 55 miles an hour forever just on sunlight, which is, from an engineering perspective, like this amazing accomplishment. Uh, and we won the race. And we came back, and I remember, just clear as ever, my boss saying, that's amazing, you know, I just want to let you know, the average raise at Hughes Aircraft Company is 6%. You're going to get 6.5% this year. <laughs> and just the feeling at that moment of, you know, your fate being in your own hands was just like, okay, this is not going to work. Um, <laughs> I, I was also fired um, between, between first and second year at, at business school. I went and worked at a consulting company. Uh, at, at the end of the summer, everyone got an offer to come back except for me. And they fired me because I scowled at people senior to me in the firm. And I, they told me that. I, I admired them for at least telling me that. But, um, you know, talk about wanting to be in control. These were all sort of strong influences. Um, <laughs> and and one, one other thing, sort of how do you get into entrepreneurship, um, I, I, was, uh, I was interviewed on uh, um, Japanese TV, actually, and I said, well, I think one of the key tests is how do you feel at 9 o'clock on Sunday night? If you feel like, oh, you know, um, ah, it was a great weekend, I'm looking forward to this week, it's a cool project, that's one thing. But if you feel like, oh, man, I can't believe the weekend's over, I'm not looking forward to work it's time to change. Well, they show this on Japanese TV and they actually showed it at nine o'clock on Sunday night and apparently they got flooded with uh, 12,000 phone calls to the switchboards or whatever saying, yes, we, I need to get a new job. Uh, so uh, um, so, so, so those, those are my influences on doing a new startup. And the biggest surprise for me, um, at the risk of Chuck's wrath, because this is one of those Ben said things, um, yeah, in terms of, I believe the most important things are um, a small team with high morale um, is really hard to defeat. Um, and you can, we had to change, three out of my four companies had to change. The original idea completely failed and had to change to a new idea. And that was a surprise to me. It wasn't so much the quality of the original idea, but it was the quality of the team and the morale of the team that I think were the key things. Yeah, interesting. So, um, similar to, to Nazila's point, that you need a team and you need a high performance team because, uh, uh, let me just generalize a little bit what, what you just said, Mike. There are very few companies that start off heading here and just go like that. Mm -hmm. Most of them go like this, even if they get there, and many more go like this and end up over here. Yeah. And the question is, how do, you, how do you do this sometimes what's called the art of small boat sailing? If any of you are sailors, mm -hmm. you know, you tack back and forth. And uh, a good team is the is the way to do it. Yeah. yeah. So so now we're gonna we're gonna sort of turn a little bit to uh, thank you very much. We're gonna turn a little bit to uh, lessons learned and and uh, to start off, uh, just asking each one of the panelists. So what um, what are the two key lessons? One or two key lessons uh, that have been important to your success, lack of success. You know, if there have been failures, you know, you, you learn more from failures often than from successes. 
Um, and uh, how and where did you learn them? And then we're gonna, gonna after we leave that, we'll come and talk about reflecting back um, on uh, the, uh, uh, your business school experience and to find out um, sort of what you think was, was most important about your business school experience. So um, uh, let's start with what are one or two key lessons that have been important to your success, lack of success in your entrepreneurial career? How and where did you learn them? And um, let's get started with, uh, let's, let's start with Will. Hmm. <laughs> um, I would say uh, the uh, kind of, I don't want to repeat myself a little bit, but I think what Mike said is also really important too. Like, you know, Randy Comazar wrote the book Plan B. And uh, it basically, it's the same point Chuck made about tacking back and forth. It's, uh, it's, it's being, having a smart, high-energy team that um, learns really rapidly what the signals the market are giving it. And, you know, we, we had a thesis about our business, and now we're on, like, thesis four, I think, probably. Um, and um, recognizing that... Uh, like another, I remember Chuck used to be on the board of Kana, and the founder of Kana told me once when I was thinking about starting a company, he said, hey, listen, the first step's the hardest, but once you start, you're just on a journey and a process. And then, um, and I think that's right. Like, so just beginning to work, be very, very aggressive about it, but at the same time, be very flexible as a team about how to tack based on what you're hearing. So theses around revenue or monetization or customer acquisition, market segment, um, positioning, all that um, it should be uh, taken with, you know, with a degree of flexibility so that you can re reconstitute yourself. And then being able to work with investors is really critical around that because investors, again, going back to my original premise about the difference between startups and investing, investors are thesis driven. So if you say, we're going to go do this, and we're, I'm raising money for this purpose, and we're going to attack this market this way, and we're going to characterize revenue model this way, and then the first board meeting, you're like, well, <laughs> That's not what that didn't work, you know. Having the ability to have that conversation with them so um, they're with you through the journey as opposed to being surprised by the tack. And so I would say being able to work down with your team and try to attack the market and then learn. And then the other challenge has been how do you work back up with your investor group to basically say, okay, well, here's what we're seeing in the market. Here's the data points. Here's how I'd characterize those. Here's why I think we need to move direction a little bit. And then making that an open conversation so they become part of the solution as opposed to like critically observing your problem. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but. So, so the lesson is uh, be ready for changes of course and embrace them. Yeah. And also have the courage to go back to your investor group and explain to them this is not, th this company is not doing what they invested in. Yeah. I mean, your, your, point, your point about as an investor, you've got a thesis and you're investing in a market, and uh, if at the first board meeting you come back and say, oops, sorry guys, I just took your $10 million, but right. we're not going there. Right, and the other thing I've, I've, I really learned, I think, and I say this with all due respect, is like investors are extremely opinionated, you know, like alpha male type people, um, typically, and they, and they have lots of opinions. Um, the other thing I learned was to acknowledge and be respectful and listen to all of them without being overly reactive to responding to any particular one of them. Like, uh, I, what I mean by that is they're going to say, you know, you should do this, 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 and this. And at first I'd be like, I'd, you know, I'd go back and be like, okay, well, that doesn't make sense. Why would I do that? And, um, but I was, I over, I, I, so there's a fine line, I guess, between having an open conversation with investors, being extremely respectful of their opinion, because CEOs who don't listen to their board get fired relatively quickly, in my experience. So you listen, but then you still are in charge. And so you have to decide how you incorporate their feedback, make them feel like they've been heard without making decisions that you go against your own gut feel or what you think the business should really do. That's something that's also hard to learn, I think. I just so you were, he was an investor with a firm called Hummer Winblad. Uh, one of those two was Ann Winblad. Uh, so let me change a little bit the alpha male to very determined and, and opinionated. Yes. How was that? That's very very fair. All right, Mike. Uh, so for me, one of the um, 
golden rules is speed is the ultimate weapon. Um, and I've learned it in a, in a good way and a bad way. Uh, I have all these little <coughs> sayings. I, I think that the probability of any business development deal ever happening declines by 10% every day it doesn't close. Um, and I really believe that. Um, so, you know, the micro, we, we closed the Microsoft deal with direct hit where our results were shown on the Microsoft search result pa page. And that deal was done in, in less than 10 days. And I think if it stretched on to, you know, six weeks or something, it would never have gotten done. Same with AOL deal. Um, I've just seen through my, you know, history which ones close and which ones don't. Same thing with, with raising money. Um, I think I've raised seven rounds of financing and six out of the seven had a signed term sheet the same day I pitched. Um, and I think if you stretch it out longer, all these questions and second thoughts and more market research and whatever comes up and, and even closing employees. Uh, I, someone comes in for an interview, we'll do uh, due diligence checks while they're still interviewing other people in the company and before they leave the building, we'll give them an offer if we like them and we'll say, are you ready to accept? And they're like floored. Right now, we say, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then we say, okay, I understand. We don't want to rush you. Uh, sleep on it and let us know at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. But we get a lot of those people. <laughs> and if we don't, I've seen people, you, you spread out and then you, you, know, you lose them. Also launching products. All my companies, we launched, we launched a product within three months, three and a half months of, of, of starting the company. And then you, it's not a very full featured product, but you get the feedback from the market and everything. So speed for me is far and away the, the most important lesson I've learned. So um, one of the points you made there had to do with, uh, with raising money and, and signing the, the, uh, the deal the same day you, you pitched it. Yeah. Were you able to do that the first time out? Let's assume that, 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 that these people are all going to be the first time out. So, yeah. So um, people always ask that. And um, so let me just say part of, the, part, of the, the, part of the reason all of us, I think, here are doing this is for aspirational. So sort of get you guys you know, motivated and excited. So um, some of these things may seem like, oh, I can't believe that. Um, but it's sort of a goal to go after. But actually, Dra Draper Fisher Jurvetson, my second company, um, so I, I had one under my belt, $13 million one. We pitched them at 8.15 on a, on a Tuesday morning in April of 1998. And we got a signed term sheet from them by 4.30. And the way you do that, anyone in this room can do that. I think some of the techniques are, um, you come into that meeting with what I call an if-then contract. And if then contract, I go get a customer for the, for the product and, and make this amazing claims. Like if we can provide search results in 50 milliseconds that 80% of your users think our results are better than your current results, would you buy them for a dollar per thousand? And almost anyone will say, yeah, okay. So they sign a letter or whatever and, and then I walk into the Draper Fisher Jurvetson with this letter. Now there's all sorts of caveats and clauses and no legal contract, but at least Draper Fisher says, okay, the you know, market risk has been eliminated. He's got a customer. And also you walk into that meeting with uh, sort of how you're going to build a product. Here's the Gantt chart. Here's the people. Here's the three people I'm going to hire. I've already talked to them. They've already committed to join. Here's the, you know, the database schema. DFJ doesn't know whether the schema is right or not right or it's really going to take six weeks. But at least they think, okay, this person seems to know where they're going. And so it's much easier for them to say, okay, yeah. And of course you also play competitive pressure. I always do my meetings. I'm meeting, you know, Will's been on the receiving side of this probably. I meet with three VCs in the same day and I say, it's moving fast and I'm actually expecting a term sheet by five o'clock today. And sometimes they'll call me back the next day and say, we're in, and I say, it's gone. And they're like, what do you mean it's gone? And I say, I told you, five o'clock. And they say, but all entrepreneurs say that. And I say, well, sometimes it is gone. So I think if you just project this, if you project this, you can get it done. And a lot of times, you know, the venture capitalists will sense this and they'll say, wow, this is, this is moving. Who are you dealing with at Draper? Uh, at, on that day? Yeah. I had Tim. Uh, Steve and uh, John, all in the room at 8.15. Yeah. Well, th they are a group that can and does and do make, yeah. make quick decisions. So that was, that was, that yeah. was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, let's see, who are we to send to Zillow? Yeah, um, wow, I'm floored. <laughs> <laughs> I want you on my board. <laughs> Um, my experience has been very different. Um, the small sailboat analogy, uh, I think, corresponds to our journey definitely with uh, Juniors, the company I'm leading right now. Um, it was different with eCircles. Uh, this was late 90s, you know, 98, uh, 99, we raised $27 million. And it was very much of this quick, uh, you know, now or never. Um, but. 
I guess my biggest lesson is that you shouldn't give up. And if nine o'clock at night on Sunday, you still feel that you have the passion, it's an, uh, it's an affair that's not finished. If you're still coming up with good ideas, then keep on at it, even if you don't have the term sheet, right? Um, uh, so, so persistence uh, always pays. And it's kind of what Will was saying about the process. Be very um, focused on what you're doing where you are in the process. And don't give it up. Don't let people derail you, because they will try to. The other lesson I learned is that maybe I'm too much of an engineer. Um, I, I really don't have it in me to go and bluff like that. Yes, you do. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I need you as a coach. Um, I, 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 I will urge all of you to find a mic and learn from, seriously. There have been uh, board members in my company that have told me, you did this and this is how you spoke about it. I think it's also perhaps, not to find a point on it, a female characteristic. We, you know, yeah, you were expecting me to do this, right? Why should I even brag about it? As opposed to, because you're dealing most of the time with these alpha males that are, I characterize them as lions, right? I am an ant, you know, I build. <laughs> and then I face the lion, and the lion, just basically all he does all day long is sit under the shade <laughs> and watch. Ooh, that looks like a good prey over there. <laughs> attack and then when the lion is attacking Mike, Mike is like, whoa, I've got three other lions coming, quick. Whereas me, I'm, okay, so we're laughing about this, but this is a serious point. Find out if you're an, a an ant, get yourself a lion partner somewhere. If you're a lion, get yourself an ant partner, right? Because both are necessary and that's, the combo is really unbeatable. The combo is what lets you do the speed, right? And the ant and the lion better trust each other. You don't look like me. Yeah, 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 I know. You wear lipstick. Yeah, I know. But I have, I have a brain. I can help, you know. Um, let me also share, since I've got the audience laughing, I think I have permission here. Um, I was six months pregnant with my second daughter. Amazon made an offer for the company I was at, um, eCircles. Uh, at the time for $250 million, $245 million to be very precise. Imagine, second child, belly comes out much faster. I am this big and I'm literally jumping up and down on the table saying to the CEO, take it, take it, take it. And he looks at me, he says, you're not an entrepreneur, you really don't have the balls. An entrepreneur will say no to them. I'm like, no, this is $245 million. Don't say no. We sold that company for $13 million to classmates.com six months from that point, right after, you know, whatever, February of 2000, mm -hmm. April of 2000, right? So at that point, I really felt this small. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, I'm pregnant, and my hormones have gotten the better of me. And I'm definitely not an entrepreneur. That's why I'm working for this guy as a VP of marketing. I may have all these ideas. I may know where I'm going. But yep, I'm not an entrepreneur. Don't let ever the world tell you that, even if you're six months pregnant, <laughs> right? <laughs> Seriously, stick to it. Go to the board. Do whatever you need, it, you know, because sometimes, right, people come in different packages. And don't let the world tell you that you need to look different. Um, anyway, I stop. Well, there's, and there's a, there's a, uh, a female intuition in some of these things, I think that's very important. I'll tell you one other story. Uh, Hotmail, Sabir Bhatia, yeah. uh, had an offer from Microsoft for $250 million. Mm -hmm. Sabir is from India. Sabir uh, called home when he was talking to his father, and he said, uh, we just had an offer for $250 million from Microsoft. And his father says, that is really great. And he says, I turn him down. <laughs> his father hangs up. <laughs> <laughs> Nanosecond later, his mother's on the phone saying, Sabir, call that man back and tell him you'll take that offer. <laughs> they took the offer. Well done. <laughs> so the moral of the story is better be a mother than an entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly. And Steve Jervison was on the board saying, yeah. don't take the yeah. offer. Yeah. Don't take the offer. Yeah. Um, well, so let's turn now to, uh, to business school education and how that might or might not have uh, helped prepare you for your work. Um, 
in general and in specific instances, uh, sort of in general, but then uh, that did or didn't. And then uh, what were the most valuable classes you took and what classes didn't you take that you wish you had taken? And I guess we'll start with Will. Okay. I thought about this quite a bit. I, I guess I have three uh, comments uh, that I thought about. This is more about what I didn't learn. Um, the first is that risk is really relative. People think that doing startups is risky. My, a lot of the guys, when I look back, I went to my 10th this, this past year, went to Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, BCG, McKinsey. They all got fired, all of them, and uh, fired in two different waves, the first in 2002 and then again in the last year. There's no such thing as a safe haven in this economy. It, People will cut jobs as soon as they decide. And by the way, you're like a number in some budgeting exercise. The CFO says, we got to cut heads, you know, 15%. And they're just like, all right, take this whole department out. It, it, so just first thing I think is just there's no such thing as a safe place. So if you're going to take risk, which you are, whether you realize it or not, you might as well be in control of your own destiny. That's the first thing that, that I think a lot of my classmates got wrong. And by the way, when you're a 10-year Merrill Lynch vet and you get whacked in New York City in the meltdown of a financial market, what are you going to do then? You're just screwed. If you're an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley and it doesn't work out, there'll be plenty of things to do, I guarantee you. So, uh, second thing is, I really think business schools overteach how rational organizations are. <laughs> uh, they basically, basically make up this thing that business, every business is some DCF model or some rational exercise, and then everyone gets around and they make a logic-based decision about how, what to do. When I first got out of the business school, I remember going into meetings and going, what the fuck just happened? Like, how did that decision just get made? Uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. And I literally was like, this is so weird. I, I was like disoriented for like weeks and just like, I don't understand how anyone's making their decisions. Like no one's even doing any analysis. They don't understand what they're talking about. And I read this book and it was kind of a cliche, but it basically said there's two types of companies. There's companies that are idea driven, where they're flat, they're merit based and People, they're generally engineering companies in a lot of ways, and they make decisions based on rational logic. And then there's people-driven companies that are driven by politics and personal affiliations, and logic has nothing to do with it. There may be this kind of pretend that there's a process, but basically there's some decision that gets made based on who knows who or this or that, and all of a sudden it gets announced to the company. And generally, if you work in those companies, everyone goes, whoa, what is going on? And I worked in a lot of people political based organizations and and as a MBA as a business person I just was completely dumbfounded by how companies were working and I, I think that there's you know they, there's like OB and people talk about that but really I think one of the challenges about business in general is or economics or finances people presume logic is the basis for how large companies make decisions and all we have to do is like a Washington DC to realize that's not true <laughs> um, the last thing I would say uh, is some, for some reason business schools are prejudiced against sales. Mm -hmm. And like I guarantee you when you graduate, none of your classmates will become salespeople. And yet John Thompson, John Chambers, Sam Palisamo, the guys who run Siebel, Siebel uh, John yeah, John Mortgage, <laughs> uh, Steve Mark Ballmer Steve. ran sales Ballmer. for Microsoft. Salespeople run the world <laughs> you know like they they are the guys that go in like and there's it's very rare that a marketing person is going to run cisco or ibm you know it's salespeople. so why is it that business schools don't don't embrace sales and sales cultures and variable based compensation like all right we're going to pay you 100 but you can make 300 if you knock it out mm -hmm. most mbas are like no nah, i just want a 125 and a little bit of variable but it's like why like if you're good and you can sell then you should go and sell and Certainly, whether you're selling to raise money or selling your product, like sales is the heart of everything we do. And I just wish that someone had said to me, like, go become a sales guy, you know, or like learn sales or sales management or like, and it's kind of like this dirty thing, like, yeah, we'll do product management, we'll do business strategy. Oh, and then there's someone's going to sell it. Well, who, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and if you're going to manage salespeople, it'd, be, it'd probably be good to do that. So I, I, I just don't get that part of it. Um, and then one last thing, and then I'm done really quickly. Uh, MBAs all have the same mental frameworks for how they make decisions. And when you go into a company, you have to, you get almost challenged a little bit. Like, so like when you're with a visual designer, they're very creative and they think in terms of pictures and, and, and 
and design. And then engineers are very logic and architectural driven. They want to understand scale and all these other things. And um, when you do a lot of group work at business school, everyone's kind of sharing a common framework because they're teaching you a, a, frame, a method of decision making. And then you get into a company and you realize there's a lot of this communication problem. You're like, oh, this person, I don't understand how they think or it makes no sense what they're saying to me. Well, that's because they, they're looking at the problem completely differently than you. And I, I would say the other thing I wish I'd done more in business school is do cross-discipline work like with other people not in my school. And I think the D school here is a great example of that where you can go work with some creative designers and some engineers and, and you can really realize that to solve a problem with people from different disciplines requires a degree of flexibility in how you communicate and how you think about it. And that was a real shock to me too when you end up, like I, I have a couple of people work for me who are designers and I, whenever I talk to them I realize like, wow, I don't even, they're like thinking in, from this problem from such a different vantage point than me, but yet it's a very valuable the way they're thinking and they're better at it than I am. So um, those are all things that uh, I wish I'd learned more of, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> so a, a while ago I had this, this dream, this fantasy of like, gosh, I wish I had this magical power that I could, to get my company to work, I could control the brain of someone I'm trying to get a business development deal with, you know, get inside, get Google to do this, get Google to, up, you know, change my page rank or whatever. Um, and uh, I'm trying to get around to supporting Will's point that um, and then I realized you actually can. Um, and that's through this, this persuasion, this charisma, this sales technique that I think is the most important thing CEOs do. Um, one way that I got a lot of experience was um, in my first company, we were selling this software product, $500 software product, over the telephone. And there were three people in the company. And uh, we had just gotten this article in this magazine. And sure enough, 300 people called <laughs> in the next two days saying, yeah, we want to get the product. We didn't even have it finished yet. We were a little bit jumped the gun. And so we, you know, we created this database and we started to put everybody's name down and call them back. And then more people would call in about the product. So in the beginning, out of every 100 calls, you know, I would take their information down, I would send them a brochure, and I would, you know, I'd say, okay, I'll follow up or something like that. I basically was closing nothing. In 10 weeks later, um, out of every 100 calls, I could get 33 of them to give me their credit card number by the end of the call. And you just learn to say, well, look, you know, we have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so why don't you just give me your credit card? I'll send it to you, and you can just do the tutorial if you don't like it. Why do you, why do you want to spend time reading the brochure? Why don't we just have the product in your hand? And you can try different techniques and different approaches um, and learn which ones work. Um, and the other thing I think that happens um, that's very powerful is when you ask for something huge, something you think is maybe a little bit outrageous, and someone gives it to you. Um, it's a very eye-opening experience when you say to AOL, you know, why don't you put our search results right here and uh, sh split the revenue 50-50 with us? And when they say, okay, you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know. Um, there are some other analogies I could give, maybe probably not appropriate uh, in this environment, but where if you go for something you think is maybe unattainable and sometimes they say yes, um, <laughs> it's a very powerful experience and it makes you try more often. Okay, so I, I say that business school should require every student before graduating to sell $10 worth of goods. $10. I second your point and I'm going to move on. Selling is underestimated and it is hard to get $10 out of a person, believe me. It doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter the size. Doesn't, so um, in our company at Juniors, we started as a free service. We debugged it and then realized that we have a long way to go for this market to realize, and we better have some money coming in. So we turned it into a subscription service. And the amount of effort and thinking that went into this exercise, I can write books about. But the net result of it is that we became the, the, the masters of our own universe, if you will. It's a very small business but it is self-sustaining, right? So <clears throat> importance of sales, I can't, I can't highlight it enough. Um, similarly, I thought that in business school, um, my biggest learning was on organizational behavior, just because I love to learn more about people and how minds work, um, and accounting, because I knew nothing about it, right? So it, those were the courses that attracted me the most and I learned the most from. Um, I, I, 
I think there is an overemphasis, at least in my years, uh, I'm sure things have changed, on uh, maximizing uh, revenues and profits as opposed to maximizing value. And that's a critical question. That, and the reason for it, I think, goes a little bit to the fact that um, all of us living in US, um, in capitalist society and so forth, I, I don't know what the reason is, but we always think bigger is better. And um, I'm not sure if that's the case for everyone. So understanding on the spectrum of very, very, very small to very, very, very large, where your idea, product, mentality, personality, wish for life, you know, what, whatever, where that fits, I think we'll start with the question, what am I maximizing? Um, certainly you can't create Cisco just maximizing value. Although some would argue that if value wasn't maximized in some form or fashion, Cisco wouldn't be created. We can have a debate about which one comes first. But at the end of the day, the question that I face as a CEO in my company right now is what am I maximizing, right? Certainly I'm not maximizing number of people coming to the site and registered members because I'm putting in front of them a 1995 barrier, right? Subscriptions, give me money. Otherwise you can't use the product. <coughs> but I'm maximizing the fact that I know the people that I have are going to pay this money because there is a pain that I solve for them. That's, that's what I'm maximizing right now. So, so, so on that. Uh, another point, um, scale. When I was at Apple, I was so ignorant. I would look around and say, oh, this is so stupid, this is so big, and they don't really see the value of my great ideas. You know, what, what is going on? I, I was like you, it's like, I'm, I'm an MBA, use me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm smart, I can do, et cetera. Um, but if you end up in a big company, please do me a favor, take the time to learn about scale. You know, just watch it. Just watch how organizations are built, watch how products are shipped, just watch it. Because there are a lot of lessons that you learn that you don't know where they, when and where they're going to come handy, but they will, I guarantee you. Um, so, so scale, it's kind of, if you don't understand it, like I was when I was at Apple, it's easy to poo-poo it and just say, oh, I'm just gonna go be an entrepreneur. But if you pay attention and learn from scale, then you can be a better entrepreneur, I think. Um, and I will harp once more again, learn where you are weak. I think in business school, because it's such a selective program at Stanford, people that come in, we all felt we were the chosen. And the school does nothing to diminish that. Right? <laughs> we're, we're continuously pumped. At the very same time that I was going through business school, my husband, my now husband, then boyfriend, was going through a PhD program at Stanford. And every day he was told how stupid he is. <laughs> Seriously, he was writing a thesis, he was doing cutting edge work, he was doing modeling like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and every day they were telling him, oh, yep, you came short, you came short. You. And every day I was, just for sitting in these great chairs, I was being told I'm wonderful. <laughs> and, um, and, and so what happens is that you really, I think, gravitate towards what you're strong at, as opposed to finding out what you're weak at. And you know, you may, you may be fine, you know, I, I, I'm good at talking, so I'm just gonna keep on talking. I may not be very good at thinking or understanding people's feelings, so I'm just gonna let another person do that. That's certainly a strategy, nothing wrong with that. But if you want to be a more um, holistic manager, a, a more well-rounded entrepreneur, I would definitely pay attention to the negative space and what it is that you don't do well and why and how can you, how can you beef it up. Thank you. So we've got a couple other questions that we can throw out here to the panel, but uh, let's, let's open it up here for see if there are any questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, Nobody's mentioned um, uh, financing uh, on your on your own, uh, uh, growing organically, and, and I actually have started a number of businesses, one of which uh, we have 30 partners who uh, each mortgage their house for half a million dollars, and the company is now the biggest company in, in the United States in this particular field. Uh, could anybody comment on that? I've never taken on any debt to, to finance anything in any business. 
Anybody want to? If not, we will. I can. Yeah, I can start here. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, so my first one was was self financed with the fifteen hundred dollars. We never raised <coughs> debt or equity from investors. Um, it's quite painful uh, to run a company with fifteen hundred dollars in invested capital. Um, it reduces your flexibility about having any computers, for example, in the company. Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't think you have to raise venture money, but it's a sort of an optimization <coughs> decision. The, the fastest way to get there a lot of times is to raise venture money. Now I actually haven't raised a lot of venture money. Direct Hit started with $1.4 million and Xfire started with $1 million. Um, so I think you can do just fine with first, with, see, I'm even, I've even drink the Kool-Aid in, in Silicon Valley. Even small amounts like a million dollars. I think you can, <laughs> you can do quite fine with that. Another question right here. Yeah, I was, thank you, by the way. My name is Erica, I'm a first year at the GSB. And we have an ethics class and an OB class. And in both of those classes, we've been talking a lot about biases recently and just how we're inherently biased and it's kind of like self-fulfilling nature. And I'm, I'm constantly struggling with that and then also looking at entrepreneurial spirit and just like head down, get it done. Like, how do you, there's a little bit of talk, of talk about attacking and reacting to the market, but how do you reconcile your own biases with also just moving straight forward ahead? By biases you mean in terms of, of uh, thinking about what, th what uh, consequences might be of a particular action, or uh, are you thinking about biases against entrepreneurship or for entrepreneurship? No, just uh, the, the price. How do you deal with your personal, your, 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 your personal, might call prior priors in terms of how the world works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody want to? I'll take that. Um, so I came in with my biases about where the direction of the product should be. And it was fortunate that I had team members that helped me see how the market was reacting, what was good and bad, and we switched that. But I had very strong bias, and I, I'm of the school that says, you know, if you don't believe it, nobody else will believe it, right? So in that, I drove really hard, and then people kept on presenting me with data, here's how it's not going to work. Um, other times, I haven't done so well, so it's a continuous struggle. Um, but you know, one of the things I do at the end of every day, I allow 10 minutes to just sit. And it's amazing the things that occur to you in the, to me uh, in those 10 minutes. I would highly recommend you doing that because those types of answers don't come by sitting and, and thinking about it. Y you know what I mean? You, you just need to let them percolate a little bit and then the answer will be self-evident. Um, but if you don't believe as an entrepreneur, nobody else will believe, so. Yeah, the only thing I found is uh, uh, that's really been helping me through that is being very authentic with people. And, um, you know, you think entrepreneurs maybe, uh, you know, uh, there's a fine line between being like constant salesman optimism and being authentic, <laughs> you know, and you've all met penalty people where you go, this guy is such a snake oil salesman, it's, you don't believe it. And so what I found that's been really helpful is having access to people where I can just be completely honest with and let my guard down and say, here, I'm really struggling with this. and. Um, I have, you know, you, you know, obviously if you're a leader, you know, you don't want to uh, panic people by making it seem like it's hopeless or anything, but if you can have access to people who can, who you can gen just generally lay out your concerns and get feedback, you, rec you really find out that, um, what happened to me recently, I went to David Hornick's conference, the lobby in Hawaii, and it was just great for almost like just uh, people sharing pain, <laughs> basically, it was really, uh, but in a way that was very cathartic in the sense that you realize like everyone goes through this, even people who are super confident, super accomplished, have gone through very dark moments, and and they've and you, you, even though you're going through that and you're concerned, you can find you can get recharged by just you know having that kind of conversation, and then being able to go back and get stronger to deal with you know your issues. Like anything on this? No, it's okay. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, right here. Ms. Zilla, you mentioned that there were things you learned from a large company that you could apply in entrepreneurship. I'd be interested in hearing some of those lessons and takeaways. And if I might, too, if you were looking at that aeronautics engineering company, you could call that you apply later. Well, Mike already told you he learned it. You get uh, you get six percent raise. Right? <laughs> yeah. Six and a half. Six and a half for me. Well, but that's only the average. So, 
Um, Mike, so what do you think? Uh, Other um, than the fact you, you, you learned you wanted to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> I mean, Will's point just made me think about, you know, the why some decisions are made. I mean, I was at, let's just say, an unnamed big company where um, <laughs> all day long people would go into meetings, there'd be no agenda, people would talk for an hour, there'd be no action items taken, people would walk out of the meeting, and it, it's, it's as if the meeting didn't happen. It's kind of like, why? Um, so we don't have very many meetings at my companies. We have a 12-minute weekly all-hands meeting on Monday, and... We have one-on-ones, you know, about 30 minutes between me and each of the direct reports. And that's about it. So, so Nazilla, you, you gave some examples of uh, the problems that, that you saw in right. large companies. But were there any things you took away from that that were valuable uh, to absolutely. you in your entrepreneurial career? I think yeah. that's uh, yeah, part yeah. of the question. Um, so one thing to do is watch executives. Um, how they run meetings, what they do, what they are paying attention to. Um, and the best way to do that is to get to know their admin. If the admin knows and likes you, you've got access to the executive. So, uh, and don't be shy, you know, go and ask them all your dumb questions. How do you run meetings and why? What kind of, so those types of access to people that when you come out of uh, that company, you will not have access to. The other thing I learned was the decision-making process in a big company. So if you're searching um, for a partnership with an AOL, what you want to do is understand how AOL works inside so that if you have a notion of what a VP looks like and what type of decisions in the size company they concern themselves with, what a director looks like, what a manager looks like, then when you're facing them, you speak to their concerns. You're not speaking out of context, if you will, their context. Um, lots of lessons about, you know, effective meetings um, as well as non-effective meetings. Again, depending on the executive, de depending on how uh, the meeting was run. Um, and then the whole idea that, you know, how do you make a ship move when there are thousands of people involved? And are there any lessons that can be taken from that to apply to a small company? Um, so, yeah, I think it was a really rich environment. Oh, one last thing. Lots of training classes and so forth available in large companies. Come to a small company, there is none of that. You have to beg your boss, you know, can I please go for this $200, you know, entrepreneurship conference or whatever. The answer is, in my company, no. <laughs> and so, so, you know, benefit from those because larger companies are more accommodating. Anything on this quote? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started my career at Morgan Stanley and, um, I went through the analyst training program there and I learned excellence, work product, and how to just get stuff done. And mm -hmm. it was just, you're, you're like, okay, Friday, four o'clock, MD calls and says, all right, we're gonna go see a client on Monday. We need to build this gigantic model and run these 50 different scenarios. And by the way, there better not be any mistakes and have it printed, bound, and at my, at my home in Westchester by 7 a.m. Monday. And, um, and uh, I just remember there at Morgan Stanley, they taught me once, like, hey, the difference between good and great is 10 minutes. And uh, I said, what do you mean by that? I said, okay, so you, you do something and you're gonna go give it to a senior guy at Morgan Stanley, print it out, put it on your desk, go walk around the block, go get a cup of coffee, come back and then read it again, and you'll find four mistakes. If you print it out and take it to him and put it on his desk, he'll find them for you, and, or she will find them for you. And um, Big companies that, are, that maintain a culture of excellence and execution can really teach you how to be very personally effective and to learn to functionally execute very quickly, like build this DCF now and do this or do that. And so Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, those are companies that are big companies, but they're high performance companies where they, a lot of good work gets done. I remember joking like, you know those army commercials we do more by 6 a.m. than most people all do all day? I used to say that, you know. I'd go down to the lobby of Morgan Stanley in New York at 5 p.m. and everyone would be going home and be like, all right, shift two is about to start. Let's go back up and crank some more stuff out. You're like, you know how to, you learn to work. And that, that, that uh, I, take, I took that away for sure. So some of you have probably worked for or are working for large companies. I mean, I think one of the things you should do is take from that, uh, that there's things to learn and it can be important to you as an entrepreneur. Uh, 15 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, but even 15 years ago, if you asked 
a venture capitalist in uh, Silicon Valley, what was the right profile for an entrepreneur they wanted to back? It would be, you know, five or ten years at Hewlett Packard or some other company to learn these life lessons. Um, if you ask them now, they don't say the same thing. And the reason why is because you have people like these three people here. <clears throat> you can go to work for an entrepreneurial company and you can learn these lessons uh, because you have a, a set of managers in there who really are really excellent and can teach you that. Um, other other um, questions right here. Uh, I'm an engineer and I don't know how to learn sales. I didn't go to business school. How do I learn sales? Well, you could try selling. <laughs> how do you get in there? Well, for, for, on, on sales, let, let me just uh, reinforce what uh, your panel has said here. Uh, you think about this. So you, you, you have a company, and you're generating revenue, and um, it comes time for uh, a vacation. Um, so who do you want to go on vacation? Let's say you're going to take a month vacation. Could you get by with the marketing people gone for a month? Could you get by with the finance people gone for a month? The only people you couldn't let go for a month are sales and operations. You've got to ship the product, and you've got to have someone to sell it, to sell it all right? So it is, it is really important. Now, your question is, how do you get a chance to do that? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, how do I get a chance, but also I, I never had an opportunity to, I'm not helping, I'm never getting an opportunity to go work at like a telemarketing firm like that where you get to like really learn. That's only one kind of sales. Right. Yeah, right. So let's get the panel. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I have a the answer for you. <laughs> I, I, I think any company you work for as an engineer would welcome an opportunity for you to sit on help desk. In my company, I am on help desk at least one once a week, at least for a couple of hours. Um, you answer emails and technical problems or issues people are having using your product and so forth. And then through answering those, you will learn how you can shift their perception of the product. That's like step number one in sales. You don't have to necessarily get dollars in exchange, but you help the company maintain that customer, right? So if you're an engineer, best place for you would be to sit on help desk and do it and offer yourself. And I know wherever you're working, people will jump at the opportunity because you, know, you have the technical know-how. You'll learn a lot that way. Then tag along to the salespeople as, uh, as the expert. Right? They always know how to sell, but they may not have as much in-depth knowledge of the product as you do. So just ask them, you know, hey, take me with you next time you go on a sales call. I promise not to open my mouth. Or if this is a really hard customer that has technical problems, tell me what they are and I'll come prepared to answer those. Um, I, so I think that the first step is just observation. Um, I'll also say that when I was an engineer, um, I wanted more money. And so I looked around at AMD and I saw salespeople making a lot of money. So I said, I want to go be a salesperson. So I went and applied and they told me, what? You're an engineer. Go back to your corner. What, what do you mean you want to be a salesperson? You're an engineer. Sit there. And that was the reason why I applied to business school. Because I thought, okay, in my limited worldview, if you wanted to sell, you had to go to business school only to learn that there's really no selling happening in business school, right? <laughs> but, so anyway, there are avenues. We now have a sales course. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, this course was created because uh, uh, I was teaching a, a class on um, Netflix, and uh, Reed Hastings, the founder, was in the class, and John Mordridge was there. And um, uh, so John asked the question. He said, how many, well, and also there were Frank Quattrone, who was the guy who took them public, and the lawyer who took them public. So John asked a question. He says, how many people in, the, in this room have been in sales? And so one person raised his hand, John. None of the students raised their hand. So he looks at Frank Quattrone. He says, um, what are you doing these days, Frank? And Frank sort of looks at him and says, oh, I get it, and raises his hand. Okay? And then, of course, uh, Reed Hastings, the CEO, raises his hand. The only person that doesn't raise his hand is the lawyer sitting over there taking notes. <laughs> no. So John walks over and says, so what are you doing these days? And he looks at him and says, oh, raises his hand. <laughs> so 
we went we left that meeting and went to went out and decided uh, to, that class and decided we needed a sales course so we have it now i don't how many of you students have taken it or thinking about taking it and it's, it's something that that i think uh, a lot of students are taking advantage of i think we have four sections this year that's great so that's great um anything else uh, on the, this this question uh, right here Question for, for, for you guys, because so far I've been hearing two years, three years cycles and you sell your company. So I've been running my company for about nine years now. Uh, have you guys had any experience or heard of people that, you know, to be in a startup and they are at a small, medium size, they're about 50 plus, 60 people. Uh, you know, running nine, ten years, do you, do you have problems with founders or key employees getting tired or impatient and stuff like that? And, and how do you handle that? Mike, when you start? Uh, that's one of the reasons why I like to sell my companies in two years. Um, uh, I think there's, there's all sorts of benefits you get from exponential growth, um, from a valuation standpoint when you're raising additional financing, from a valuation standpoint when you're selling the company, from an employee morale standpoint. You know, if, literally if you show this exponential growth of any metric, um, then everyone's so excited. Every weekly meeting, wow, the number's up, you know. Um, I think it's really hard to have, um, to maintain the intensity and drive over the longer periods of time. I think there are different sets of people. There are certain sets of people who, they couldn't do it. I mean, I couldn't do it. Um, and I guess the only other comment I have is, I, I, I sometimes advise startup companies and they say, oh yes, you know, I'm, um, engineering team's feeling a little bit, you know, not driving as hard, they're, you know, they're leaving early and whatever, and you know, how do I get them to, to work harder? And a lot of times I say, that's the wrong question. The question is, that the problem isn't what they're doing now, the problem is who you got in the company in the first place. Um, it's a little bit simplistic, but I think it comes down to the questions you ask during interviews and the type of people you get in the first place. So you may want to consider switching the team out to people who are, you don't have to worry about sort of motivation and drive issues that they are, it's so much internal part of them that it's not an issue for, for you. Greg, you had your hand up. Well, I was just going to say I'm, I'm the anomaly in the room because I'm a soft drink company and not a software company, but we have sales and marketing has been, been very much a part of what we have uh, been doing. And uh, the more important part, of course, is the next session which I'm going to, which is on angel investing, because we're at the stage we need more money. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that there are so many companies out there that where there are opportunities to get sales experience. It doesn't necessarily need to be in your particular field either, and that's one of the things that I want to emphasize is that you go out and get any kind of sales experience and you can apply that to, uh, for instance, if you're an engineer, you can, you can apply that same learning to another area. So I was wondering whether any of you in your careers have, and everything has been technology focused, obviously, because of where we are, but has, have you had experiences in your lives that have taught you that sales experience or, or marketing side of the world? Uh, I I remember uh, working for an entrepreneur, and he told me that every CEO has basically two jobs to sell and raise money, and um, and so I've had two. I've been CEO twice now, and I basically my view is like, you know, I've subscribed to Mark Leslie's philosophy of this is like, crack the sales code, the formula for sales yourself, get Renaissance people that are not typically functionally aligned in any one area, but they can do everything and work out the process for how you sell. And as soon as it, it's starting to be codified and repeatable, then you can bring in you know, execution people who are expert at, at a discipline. And so I, I think um, that's been my approach to make the first five or six sales, uh, r realize what works, what doesn't work. And then as soon as I feel like, you know what, this is kind of, we got it, then then you can go hire someone who's literally their resume says salesperson. You say, okay, here's the sales process, here's the collateral, here's your number. Let's go do it together three or four times, and then like launch them off. And so, uh, just uh, that's that's kind of what I did. Yeah. 
Big up the United. Right here. I just want to follow up on your point about the VC saying we should work for HP first. Yeah. Whoa, what do they say now? <laughs> <laughs> now they now they they don't say that anymore because the because the uh, people uh, who are running startup companies often have the same kind of experience and they're sophisticated, so you can learn from them. They don't say don't do it, but it used to be that's exactly that, that's the path. You know, we won't invest in you at Kleiner Perkins unless you've been at HP for 10 years, not quite like Chuck, that. Chuck, did you see what Leone said when he went to give a talk in San Jose? No. They said uh, no one over 30. Yeah. Seriously, that's what he said, and he got yeah. a lot of trouble for it. But Sequoia, they, they were quoted as saying, we well, don't, Sequoia is we the don't want to hire guys over 30. Yeah. So uh, I was like, well, okay. Sequoia, <laughs> so Mike Morris told me the other day that, that he doesn't believe in market research. I said, what do you mean you don't believe in market research? He says, he says the individual entrepreneur has to understand the, uh, the market so well and have, you know, the million other people that are just like him or her or else we're not going to invest in them. So that's, a, that's I would say that's an extreme approach. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. We, you had one here. Anybody else? Right up here. So you all have kind of a long-term experience around and it's in several cycles. Can you kind of like comment on opportunities and risks of this specific period in time in terms of economy and the VC kind of like model that is maybe broken, green, or red? Yeah, I... I I, I would say that um, uh, one of the big challenges the venture business, of course, everyone's talking about is there's a surplus of committed capital and there's no public market, m and exits are challenged. And so you have the situation where the median IT exits like 50 million bucks and, you know, most f the average company is raising uh, or median companies raising, like, I don't know, 18 million or something. So like, how's the math work? So I, I would say there's this rise of this new, like the Mike Maples, the first rounds, the uh, True Ventures, uh, Founders Fund, there's this whole new class of investors now that are trying to be super capital efficient. Y Combinator, probably the best example of that. And so I think uh, that combined with uh, huge differences in the cost of operations, you know, the rise of Amazon EC2, S3, the ability to not own a single machine and run a pretty big web application. So I think the, the rise of capital efficiency and, um, and, uh, and and a new class of investors whose expectations are slightly different from someone who's got an $800 million committed capital fund um, is pretty interesting um, and, and makes it possible, especially if you're a software guy, to be uh, very capital efficient and find access to capital where people have expectations where a $50 million exit is actually part of their model. I, I will add something else. If, uh, I, I think every um, interaction now is so dependent on email um, that there will be a shift towards actual customer support and customer service. So to the extent that you can have more hand-holding, you can have a more complicated product that's web-based, not just rely on user experience for that. Um, and how you train these people to help you and what technologies they use, I, I think that's going to become a very rich environment um, you know, the, the whole idea of customer support and customer education, um, I think we'll see a renaissance uh, tagging along all the things that Bill said. Mike, any last comments? I, I, think you should, I think you should ignore whatever macroeconomic trends are around. Um, I think, uh, sure, there's disadvantages with, in some situations because it's hard to raise money, but there's counterbalancing positive advantages. It's easier, it's easier to hire and retain people now, and it's easier to get cheaper office space now, and the competition is lower because they can't get funded. So I really think you should ignore macro things and just build your company and just not worry about it. I think we're going to close with that. Thank you very much, Pam. We appreciate it. It's nice meeting you. Yeah.